John chapter 3. John 3. I did not mention a second ago when 
introducing Neil that the second time I ate at Joe T. Garcia's, Neil was there. <laughs> Would have been the first time, but we stole uh, Perry's car, Howell and I did, just to go find where Joe T's was. And we actually ate there the night before. I and mean, we'd already eaten supper that night too, so another story. Joe T's knew how much I talked about them, they would sponsor me. <laughs> so, join me in prayer. Father God, help us this morning. You are wild beyond our understanding and imagination. Your son Jesus was wild. Your Holy Spirit is wild. And you call us to follow you in a wild way that is not like this world. We've been set apart by you. Let us pray you help us this morning, help me this morning to be hands off. And may you be hands on our hearts, our ears, leading us wherever you want us to go, teaching us what we most need to hear. So I invite you to be who you are so that you can make us who you want us to be. In your name I pray. Amen. Back when I was a youth minister, my favorite youth ministry activity was wild goose chases. We would send the youth off in groups, split them in groups, give them a clue, assign them a driver, an adult driver, and that clue would lead them tearing out of the church parking lot to a place across town. And they would find a clue there, and then we'd go to the next place, about 12 to 13 clues. The chase would culminate in a place where they were searching for a wild goose, a little paper goose about that big, hidden somewhere, and the winner, the winning team, would get free pizza at Pizza Hut. There's no single greater motivator for teenagers than pizza. And I love doing wild goose chases. I always had great fun planning them. The little clues were about that, looked like a little strip of paper, just hard to see. It was a lot of fun, but I don't know if you've ever felt like you've been led on a wild goose chase. What feelings usually accompany that when it happens? Probably frustration. Maybe futility, foolishness. Suppose I suggested to you that a wild goose chase is the perfect example of Christ-centered living. Several years ago, I came across a little tidbit of history about the Celtic Christians. The Celtic Christians of the third to sixth century, they described the Holy Spirit as the wild goose. Not the gentle cooing dove of uh, peace, but rather the honking, undo undomesticated, unpredictable wild goose. The more I pondered this lesson, the more I realized they're right. The Irish church pegged the spirit of God correctly. This is the essence of the Holy Spirit we see displayed in scriptures. It's the essence of the heart of God. We follow a wild God. God is not predictable. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. I mean, he calls a man, Abraham, says, I'm going to make a great nation with you, through you, through your children. Allows them to have, he and Sarah to have a child late in life, in their 90s to 100. And then what does he do when the child gets of age? He calls Abraham to go out and make a sacrifice and lo and behold, make Isaac the sacrifice. That's wild. That's unpredictable. And yes, he provided a ram in the thicket, but Abraham didn't know that he was going to do that. Abraham was trusting in God that he would raise Isaac from the dead if he actually sacrificed him. He took God in his word. And Jesus came along and look at him. He was wild, unpredictable. You never knew what was coming out of his mouth. We read what he said now and we have the the luxury of knowing the full story and it, was, it started to lose some of its sting, some of its bite, but he's wild. And the Holy Spirit is wild. Where he leads, if he gets hold of our lives, he guards our steps, he calls us, guides our steps, he calls us to follow the trail of the wild goose. And if we're obedient to the cry of the wild goose, then our obsession will become the chase 
of the wild goose. It is in our nature to take the wild goose trail. This truth is revealed in all places. One of the most famous accounts of scripture, John chapter three, Nicodemus came to Jesus at night. Nicodemus was a member of Jesus's greatest detractors, the Pharisees. It would be the Pharisees who would ultimately instigate the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The Pharisees, they would be the last to take up membership in the Jerusalem chapter of the Jesus fan club. They were not Jesus's fans. And yet Nicodemus saw something in Jesus that rang true. He couldn't quite understand how Jesus had such authority when he taught. So he went to see him at night under the cover of darkness in John chapter three. And, and if you read the entire chapter, the part I want to focus on takes place right after that portion of scripture that, uh, right after where Jesus had just told Nicodemus, you must be born again. <laughs> and this confused Nicodemus, uh, this passage would culminate in the gospel gem, John 3, 16. A, a, a passage of scripture so familiar that all you have to do is put 3, 16 out there and a lot of people already know. They know exactly what that means. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world, not for God so loved the predestined. For God so loved everybody. That's the pinnacle of this passage. But there's some verses back down in five through eight that where Jesus just dropped some truth to Nicodemus and he drops some truth to us that should really be like, wow, when we understand what Jesus is saying here. Jesus said, hey, Nicodemus, you must be born again. And Nicodemus' response to that was, Jesus, I'm a big boy now and uh, there's no way I can be reborn the same way as I was the first time. So how can what you say be true? And picking up verse five, Jesus answered, said, believe me when I say that everyone must be born from water in the spirit. Anyone who is not born from water in the spirit cannot enter God's kingdom. The only life people get from their human parents is physical, but the new life that the spirit gives a person is spiritual. So don't be surprised that I told you, you must be born again. Nicodemus, the first birth, the natural birth was of water when you entered the world the first time, but it's not enough to be born of water. You must also be born of the spirit. It's not enough for you to be born into the household uh, of the chosen people, the Jews. It's not enough to be born in that right household. You must be born of the spirit. Spirit, you must have a second birth. The second, second birth is necessary to enter God's kingdom. And it begins with a spiritual birth. You must be born of the spirit. You must have the spirit of God, plant the seed of God in your heart. And that seed must come full term, resulting in your spiritual birth. Resulting in your rege regeneration. Resulting in your being saved from your sins by my blood resulting in an ongoing eternal camaraderie with me forever. You should not be surprised that I say this. King James reads, marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. The Greek word for marvel means unintelligent wonder. <laughs> That's what it means. In other words, Nick, get that goofy look of consternation off your face and wise up, man. You must be born again spiritually. And I don't know, in my imagination, I can picture at this moment, Jesus and Nicodemus are out, maybe in a courtyard. There's a sycamore tree over there. and Suddenly the wind blows through and begins to move the limbs of that sycamore. And Jesus was ever sharp as a Roman nail. He looked at what was taking place physically around them and said, hey, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear it, but you don't know where it's coming from or where it is going. The wind blows wherever it pleases. The Greek word for wind is pneuma, which also happens to be the same Greek word for spirit. 
Jesus was a punster. The pneuma blows wherever it pleases, physical wind. So it is with everyone born of the pneuma. Nicodemus, you can't see the wind, but you can see evidence of the wind. Swaying limbs, quaking leaves, waving wheat, deviling dust. Likewise, Nicodemus, you can't see the spiritual birth. The second birth is a matter of faith, but you can see evidence of the Holy Spirit in someone's life. And Nicodemus, you can't see the wind, but you can feel the power of the wind. And you can experience the unpredictability of the wind. When Nicodemus, you've seen the wind change directions, one moment blowing northwest and the next moment blowing southeast. Sometimes it's a gentle breeze. Sometimes it gusts. Sometimes it will cool your sweat-soaked brow. And sometimes it will push the turban right off the top of your head. Sometimes it will be so slight as to lightly bear the scent of fresh-baked bread. And sometimes it will be so forceful as to violently suck the breath right out of your lungs. Spiritual birth is unseen, but it's real. And the evidence of spiritual birth is its power and unpredictability. After Jesus had illustrated the spirit, Numa, with the wind, Numa, he said something that Nicodemus did not totally catch because if you follow the conversation, Nicodemus asked another question and the conversation moves on up to the mount of, for God so loved the world. But it's a telltale revelation Jesus dropped here of the true nature of those who have experienced the second birth. He said, you know, you, 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 can, you can't see the wind. The wind blows wherever it wants. You hear it, but you don't know where it's coming from or where it is going. It is the same with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Those born of the Spirit are like the wind. You cannot fully explain or predict either the wind or the journey of a spirit-led child of God. According to Jesus, those of us who have been born of the spirit bear a family resemblance to the Holy Spirit. He said flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to, to spirit. Occasionally I will look in the mirror and I will see facial characteristics of my parents. And I will hear my voice. I will hear it speak with the syntax that my father used. Just as we pick up our family characteristics, so we also have the same rhythm and syntax of the spirit. A soul born like or was born into the kingdom of God, starts to look like and act like the Spirit as convention gives way to spontaneity, as practicality flies out the window and unpredictability takes its place. And I want to just pause right here and say, I'm not talking about being odd for God. There's enough of that out there. I'm talking about the Spirit leading you in ways that make you uncomfortable at times, that's an indicator. He's like, why would I do that, God? Had, that have you even pausing before you yield to it. Lean into it. Let it lead you where he wants you to go. This is how we're to live our lives. And I will tell you, I'm the personality type that this was not easy for me. I, I like to, to make the plan and, and work the plan. And sometimes I've found, sometimes in my life, the greatest detriment to the spirit has been ministry because I'm following the, you know, this is what we're called to do and, and have to, having to learn to yield to the spirit. This life I live now where I have a blank calendar in front of me and I fill it in the day after, that has not always been my habit, but yet the spirit leads in such a way that there's an unpredictability to our days. If you have your day timer in front of you and you have it all marked out and you do not leave room for the Holy Spirit to enter into that, are you following the Spirit of God? Are you bearing the nature of the Spirit? You may not be living up to the Christian life that God has for you. 
which is sad really because as spiritual beings, as those born into the kingdom of God, it is the most natural thing in the world to follow the trail of a wild goose. You know, through the years, I've been on many hikes in the national park system and the national park system has indoctrinated me well. Most of the national parks will tell you, you stay on the trail. When you go up switchbacks, don't get off the trail. Don't cut straight up because if you do that, it will cause erosion. And that's drilled into me and I understand that. And it's also the same with our lives. The world prescribes a trail for us. The American trail is marked by success, material, pro material productivity, how many people you have influence over, all these things. We're told don't rock the boat, just follow and get in lockstep with the world and the systems of the world. Don't rock the boat. The Bible has something to say about the trail of the world. It says it is broad to accommodate the hordes that travel on it. And it leads to destruction, is what Jesus said. The destruction, the destruction referred to here is spiritual destruction. You know why? Because the broad path is an unnatural path, even for those born of water who have the potential to be born of the Holy Spirit. And it is detrimentally unnatural for those who have already experienced rebirth. So it's in our nature to walk the trail of the wild goose. It's also in our calling to take the trail of the wild goose. On the day you surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, he came to live inside your heart. The Holy Spirit moved in and took up residence. That's what you received that day, but when you became born again, you also received something else. You received a calling. Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said, talking about the church, he said, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Uh, it, it the Greek word for church there is ekklesia. You know what ekklesia means? Ekklesia means called out ones. Followers of Christ are those who are called out into the world. They are called off the path of their own way and the world's way, and they are placed on the path of the wild goose. They are called out of the flights of fancy dictated by the sons of men and placed in the B formation behind the lead wild goose, which is the spirit of the Son of God. As the Apostle Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, our walking around the body is no less than the temple of the Holy Spirit, the temple of the wild goose. I'm going to look all through the Bible from cover to cover. We find example after example of individuals whom the Lord sent on a wild goose chase. Abraham, Hebrews 11, 8, reveals an amazing truth about Abraham's call. It says, by faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed the call of the wild goose and went even though he did not know where he was going. I mean, it would have been common courtesy for God to at least give him some coordinates. <laughs> but no, Abraham, pick it up and take it wherever I lead you. And when you get there, I will tell you you're there. I'm sure that went over well with Sarah. <laughs> That's amazing. Jesus came along one day walking by the beaches, walking by the tax tables. He stooped down, leaned forward, whispered in their ears, and you could hear the sound of fishnets, boat ropes, money bags dropping as 12 men embarked on the trail of the wild goose. Simon Peter was working on his tan one day up on a rooftop in Joppa. The wild goose honked in his ear and prepared Peter's heart for Peter's next ministry assignment. A knock was heard downstairs at the door and the, the spirit cried, Simon, three men are looking for you. You go downstairs. Don't hesitate to go with them for, for I have sent them. Another classic example in the book of Acts, Acts 8, 26, it says an angel of the Lord told Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. 
And after receiving those specific instructions, Philip crosses path with an Ethiopian who happens to be riding along in a chariot reading his Bible. He's knee deep in the book of Isaiah. The spirit changes Philip's direction by invoking Philip to run along parallel to that chariot. The Ethiopian is stumped over the one who is led like a sheep before the slaughter. And Philip asks him, do you understand what you're reading? And the eunuch says, who is this lamb? Philip replies, move over and I'll tell you about him. He tells him about him. They, he, he leads him to faith in Christ. They stop along the body of water. He baptizes the, the eunuch. And, and then it says, the Bible says, the spirit of God whisks. Philip away. The whole scenario never would have taken place if Philip had not already been traveling the wild goose trail. Even the very people who came up with that anomalous example of the wild goose, the Celtics, they followed Jesus in this manner. They followed the spirit in this manner. For when the Irish Christians obediently followed the call to go and tell all the nations, you know what they would do? They would put out in a boat off the beach of Ireland and, and they were dispossessed of any human notions of where they were going. And they prayed that the wind of the Holy Spirit would lead them where they needed to go. And the pneuma of the pneuma blew them to missionary stops that included Norway, the Faroe Islands, Iceland, Germany, and Switzerland. One of my favorite authors, many years ago, early in his ministry, he, he, told, he, he told about one of his favorite sayings or Favorite mottos, Mark Batterson, one of his favorite mottos is ministry happens. <laughs> ministry happens. And he went on to explain at least 90% of the ministry that happens in the Gospels is spontaneous. Jesus was headed from one place to another and an opportunity would present itself. Christ is the one we claim to follow. He, his call to us is deny self, take up your cross daily, and follow me. My translation, my paraphrase, get off the trail of yourself, surrender to the path of the wild goose, and let the wind of the Spirit blow you where he will. And when you get there, honk if you love Jesus. That's your purpose in life. That's as pur purpose-driven as it gets with him. The trail of the wild goose, it's in our nature to take this trail. It's in our calling to take this trail. And it's in our best interest to take this trail. As already mentioned in Matthew 7, 13, broad is the world's trail that leads to spiritual destruction. And narrow is the trail that leads to real life. And only a few find it. The wild goose trail is the narrow road. This is the trail that leads to life. And not just eternal life when we die, but overflowing life now. This is the trail that leads through the kingdom of God here and now. With that broader interpretation in mind, suddenly those that miss treading the narrow path include more than just the lost. Because unfortunately, many Christians will miss it as well. Now, they'll not miss heaven after earth, but they will miss opportunities to bring heaven to earth. Many believers will miss the life they could have had and relinquish the influence they could have had because they didn't have the faith to totally place themselves at the beck and call and the shift and the blow of the Holy Spirit. I've been on many miles of trails in Big Bend National Park there on the border of Texas and Mexico. And I told you earlier that the National Park Service had indoctrinated me well to stay on the trail. But one day we learned something from a ranger there that we were not aware of. The ranger told us, this is one of the parks where you can pretty much go explore wherever you want to. You can get off the trail. As long as you're an experienced hiker, you have a compass, topographical map, you're free to explore wherever you choose. And man, that changed things. 
there were discoveries we made when we started hiking that way. Uh, things that still are rich in my, in my memory. I remember one day walking up on a hillside. We're talking about we're in the middle of the Chihuahuan Desert. And this whole hillside that I'm looking at, I'm look, I can't believe what I'm seeing because what I'm seeing, seashells. Seashells. Well, the water, the earth was covered in water and flood. It's amazing to see all these fossils of seashells. Another place came, came into this uh, deep ravine where there was a natural stone amphitheater and your voice would just echo and ping off of it. One day we were walking across some big, huge, huge rocks and, and they were like flaky biscuits. That's what they looked like. And as we walked across these rocks, you could hear that it was just like, we are almost like walking on drums. And there was just a little hollowness underneath. I'm convinced there were caves up under those rocks. And it was amazing. Once we were freed from the trail, all that we discovered. Jesus said, John 8, 31 through 32, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. When we learned the truth that we could go wherever we pleased, it set us free and to make some discoveries that we would not have made otherwise. We found liberation in this newfound truth. And what is true in the physical is also true in the spiritual. I mean, if you just, be sensitive to the voice of God's Holy Spirit and let him lead your day where he wants you to go. Hello, get ready to have some adventures that will be the most memorable you'll carry with you. About a month ago, I discovered something. It's like it was kind of a game changer for me. I need something to remind me that I follow the Holy Spirit. We all do. Here's my reminder right here. I don't know what you think this is. It is a Bible of sorts. Uh, this is a harmony of the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Harmony of the Gospels is where someone takes what Jesus did, what Jesus said, and blend them together so that it follows in sequence. And this is a harmony of the Gospels. You can get these, you can order these online. Uh, let me give you the email address or at the website, plusnothing.com. That's it, plusnothing.com. Why, what's the point of that? Well, you need Jesus, plusnothing.com. And you can order these for free. Now, if you want to, and they're very nice. I mean, that looks very, very nice, but I've started taking these around with me. The last person I shared this with, I was eating at a restaurant in Birmingham. I was sitting there at the bar. It was lunchtime. I was sitting there at the bar, where I chose to sit, and my server was Jeremiah. I began to use my questions. I have three. Where are you hurting? What is your hope? And then the third one that I used to use back in the day of the Jesus test, in 30 seconds or less, can you tell me who Jesus is? You ask somebody that question. You'll learn quickly in 30 seconds their spiritual GPS. You'll be able to pinpoint exactly where they are. And so I asked those questions of Jeremiah. He was prepping for the day. And, and, you know, he was talking about being caught up, the stress of being caught up in that. And Jeremiah was his name. So I said, hey, man, uh, Jeremiah, uh, where you, did your mom name you after the book that's named after you in the Bible? He said, yeah, she did. And I said, well, hey, man, do you, have you ever read that book? And he uh, said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, my grandmother gave me a Bible. I'm reading it now. Uh, I've started reading it. And he said, I'm only in Genesis uh, that's a long way to go. And I thought he's going to flame out Leviticus and Numbers because most people do. And uh, just in talking with him, just mentioned to him about Jesus. And I just pulled this out of my pocket and said, hey, I'm going to give you this. And he, you know what he said to me? He said, in all the years I've been serving, no one's ever, I've never had a customer give me a gift. That looks like a nice gift. That's not something they're going to throw away. And I've been praying for Jeremiah ever since. Because that contains the story of Jesus. Those are the words right out of Scripture. And it's amazing what the Holy Spirit will do if you're open to moments like that to allow him 
to do it. Anybody who is a believer can do that. And he, as I got ready to leave, he said, hey, man, next time you come here, he may have been wanting me to come back, you know, to uh, make sure I ate there again. But he said, next time you come here, I want to talk to you about what I read. I'm like, okay. So I'm looking forward to going back to talk to Jeremiah. Those born of the Spirit, the wind blows where it goes. You don't know where it's coming. You don't know where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. The trail of the wild goose calls. It's in our nature to take this trail. It's in our calling to take this trail. It's in our best interest to take this trail. And it's also in the best interest of everyone around us. We have a lot of people hurting right now. We got a lot of people who are open right now. And if you'll just go into this world sensitive to the voice of God's Holy Spirit, not looking, not going with a crowbar, looking to, to pull something apart that's not naturally there, but you just go and you just observe it and see, and God will give you opportunity because there will be people there and it will be the most natural thing to enter into a conversation with them. Similar to the conversation that Jesus and Nicodemus had. Let's pray. I just want to ask you this morning, are you on this trail? Are you on the trail of the wild goose? Do you start your day in his presence, just saying, Lord, I don't know where you're leading me today, but I want to follow in your footsteps. Are you on that trail? Or are you working against God by walking where it is unnatural for you to walk? Are you true to God's call in your life? Do you trust God enough to accept that the wild goose trail is the best place? you could be in your life right now. How's God speaking to your heart? How is his Holy Spirit wooing you to himself? At what point during the message did you feel the nudge? Did you feel the, the pinprick of conviction? If God's spoken to you like that this morning, that's always a good place to start. Father, you're leading us. Give us courage to follow. Help us to be like you, wild, wild in the truth. Thank you for calling us. Thank you for using us. Help us now. In your name I pray. Amen. This name is 158.